Hey metalheads, you like tattoos? Of course you do. If you're in the Louisville, Kentucky area, come on over the bridge to Clarksville, Indiana and get you some ink done at Ageless Art. If ink isn't your thing, they have a piercing studio as well. Visit agelessartclarksville.com to see some frequently asked questions and meet the staff. The shop is open Monday through Thursday, 12 to 8 p.m., Saturdays, 12 to 10 p.m., and Sundays, 12 to 6 p.m., all appointment-only spots. You can set up your appointments by phone at 812-283-1793 or email agelessarttattooandpiercing at gmail.com and someone will get you set up for your first or your next tattoo or piercing. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. In 2017, one man's vision and passion for all things metal started out as a record store in his house. Years later, the fight against a mainstream empire continues as Shade Beast. An independent metal collective and online store based in Athens, Georgia, is the world's premier heavy metal brand for music heads that value authenticity over the mainstream acceptance. Featuring original t-shirts from some of the best underground artists, as well as stickers, posters from the Shade Beast Presents concert series. Unique, one-of-a-kind collectibles and small curated selection of vinyl and cassettes from the masters old and new. Visit ShadeBeast.com and enter promo code SITHLORD for free domestic shipping on your first order, whether you're a new customer or returning. And be sure to join the Shade Beast social groups on Facebook and the interwebs to keep up with the new release announcements and talk all things metal and Star Wars. You'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and filth. Thank you for tuning into the Metal Forge. I am Mark Jackson and I am your host. The premise of the show is pretty simple. Awesome interviews and awesome music. If you want to contact me, hit me up at MetalForgeRadio at gmail.com or visit the website MetalForgeRadio.com. And now, let's get this show on the road. What is going on, Metalheads? Thank you all for tuning in to another week of the Metal Forge. Yeah, fuck yeah, man. Like, I am feeling good today. Um, yeah, like, I just turned into Jeff Goldblum, I think. Man, this is some good shit. Uh, no, nah, man, like, today we have Ozzy Darden from the band Children of the Reptile, and we're gonna be talking some awesome fucking metal with him. Uh, like, the North Carolina scene, you know, we... Uh, we're Jason from the Heavy Metal Wasteland, Jason Gardner uh, of the Alehorn and Mudhorn, along with myself, uh, where, you know, 
uh, he's from. He's you know they're from opposite ends of the of the way there, but but yeah, totally cool shit. You know that whole North Carolina, that swamp metal scene there, North South Carolina, Georgia, all that cool shit. I'm gonna get into all of that. But first, how the fuck are you all doing this week? Uh, it it's been fun. It's been interesting. It's fucking flying high. Like we played a show last weekend. Overload did. I say we. Uh, Overload played a show last weekend at uh, Art Sanctuary. It was Metal Night at Art Sanctuary, promoted by the Metal Forge. Yeah, and uh, there were some fucking awesome bands. Blood Curse. Uh, look for them to be on the show here in here in the soon future. Uh, Eulogy and Blood, who has been on the show in the radio days, but we need to set up something for you know Chris and Scott and Jay and Marlon to come in here and and do some awesome fucking uh, updated talk with Eulogy and Blood and the band Kerr, uh, a band who was uh, in uh, the first year of the podcast in 2020. Uh, yeah, I love those dudes. We op- uh, we played a show with them at uh with and DRI one time at uh, Trixie's uh, the Tiger Room kind of thing. So yeah, total cool shit. Uh, but yeah, all those bands need to come back in here, and we're gonna keep them coming up. And you know, we're gonna keep doing bigger and better shows. We're gonna get more awesome guests, and things are fucking happening. Seriously, like. Things are seriously happening. Stay tuned for some awesome fucking announcements. Um, But yeah, total cool shit. And Jason is back from the heavy metal wasteland. He's been digging around. It's like, dude, what are you going to find? And this week's topic, holy shit, he is absolutely right. Yeah, it's been a couple of weeks now, but it's still like a bitch, you know? Let's see what Jason has to say. Welcome back to the Wasteland. Hope everyone's been well and that good fortune is finding you and your loved ones in these weird and strange times. I have picked a topic that is pretty random, uh, some would say out of left field for this edition of the Wasteland. But uh, hear me out because you might actually agree with me when I you know, um, make my points. And that is uh, Daylight Savings Time. Or some people right now here call it summertime. So, let me give you a couple personal reasons why I really don't like this time of year. Uh, First off, it is dark as shit in the morning. Because, you know, it's always darkest before the sun comes up. So, I have to load my truck up in the mornings usually. That means i got to break out the flashlight, make sure I have everything. You know, move stuff around if need be in the back. It's just a hassle that I don't have to deal with in the wintertime. Second reason I hate it is because it's, it's really light late into the uh, evening, which sucks. Um, I don't want to have to know I can go out and mow the yard or weed eat um, and feel guilty about it if it's light out. I'd rather just come home, eat supper, and relax and watch TV or podcasts or play games or you know play on my electric drum kit or something other than feel guilty about not, not being outside doing yard work. And the third and most important reason I dislike daylight savings is I have small kids and they don't stay uh, naive forever when you tell them it's bedtime at 8 o'clock and it's still bright out till 9 o'clock they uh, they ask questions and you pretty much have to either lie or just uh, be an asshole and just tell them too bad uh, go to sleep and of course they don't until it gets dark because they're kids and that's what they do so those are my personal reasons why I dislike this time so much now let me get to the music related reasons why I dislike this time so much. I'm going to break it down into two groups. Uh, I play music and I go see music. So let's go to the first one. Uh, as you know, I am in a small band that plays mostly dive bars. And a lot of times the shows are three or four band bills. And in the wintertime, you know, those shows will start at 8 o'clock and they're usually pretty well attended. Because as we all know, nobody really gets ready to go out until it gets dark. Nobody gets excited to go out when it's the sun is blazing outside. Um, 
metal is meant to be played under cloak of darkness. So when people don't show up and you're playing while it's daylight outside, you know you can see it through the window. Uh, you can see it in the crowd area that nobody's there except for you know maybe a few diehards or you know, just some people that are you know day drinking and just are still there. It's hard to get excited about playing a show. You know, and you're one of the first two bands, or or they push it back, and the last band plays at like twelve or one because they wait for people to show up. So it really doesn't benefit bands one way or another uh, being uh, light out this late. Uh, it really sucks. I I speak from experience because I have been that band many times in the summertime when you get on a show and you play to nobody except for the. Uh, other bands that are there and probably they're outside smoking cigarettes or something. So, there you go. So, on the flip side, or the B side, if you want to be creative, uh, is going to see bands. Um, back in my, uh, you know, festival going days, um, there's nothing worse than, you know, being in the sun that extra hour unnecessarily. You're exposed to sunlight beating down on you, which has all kinds of health implications, like skin cancer. You have to hydrate yourself for an extra hour. You have to withstand bands that you don't care about for an extra hour. So, really, to me, there's no um, benefit. And then the worst part of all is when you when that headlining band uh, comes on and it's still light out. So, you know, a lot of bigger bands, you know, their first intro is, you know, to a big pyro blast or something like that, and it loses all effect because it's daylight out, and you can't see it. You might be able to hear it, but you can't see it. And that's another thing, too, is it sounds so much better at night when the sound travels and just hits a little bit different than the middle, middle of the day. So that's another uh, side effect also that you might not think about is uh, sound quality. Um, but I have heard bands that sounded really good during the day and as the night uh, crept in, something happens to the PA. It must, you know, I guess the um, air pressure or, you know, humidity probably has a lot to do with that. So it's not uncommon for the sound to get worse as the day progresses. But usually, usually the atmosphere uh, makes it where it doesn't really matter. It's just like, finally, this is the way metal music should be viewed and heard and experienced is to the backdrop of the night sky. Like, we're all enclosed in this, you know, cloak of darkness, which is very cool to me. Nobody ever really talks about the band who played at 2 p.m. on the main stage. It just it's never really brought up. So, anyway, guys. That's my uh, wasteland for this week. Um, let me know in the comments if you agree or you know disagree. Just be uh, civil and cool about it. You know, a little bit of a uh, ribbing is okay. Just uh, you don't need to get personal. And uh, as always, uh, I want to thank Mark for giving me a few minutes on his podcast. Uh, I know I get in some uh, strange and off the wall topics sometimes, and this this is one of them. But you know, it is something I really uh, do feel passionately about. That. I don't think it's ever really discussed. And with that, guys, uh, as always, stay safe, stay heavy, keep the heavy metal flame lit. The best way to do that is patreon.com slash flamekeeper. And we will talk to you guys next time. Dude, Jason, yes. Uh, I absolutely fucking hate the time shift of like the one hour fucking spring forward fall back. You know, that fucking weird dumb shit. It's like, ugh. When I was uh, a kid, we had this thing in Indiana. It was called Slow Time. And it's where part of the state didn't change their clocks. Uh, it spring forward and fall back. And so, like, part where I grew up was on what they called slow time, which was an hour behind the big city of Louisville. You know, it's like, at f it's 5 o'clock in Louisville. It's only 4 o'clock here. And it, it was always, like, a big fucking mess. Like, uh, 
all my Indiana peeps know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you if you uh, lived out in the country about the whole slow time thing, uh, but yeah, it's just like weird shit, and um, they did away with that, and hopefully they do away with this fucking daylight savings time bullshit. Anyways, I, I think this was supposed to be the last one. I'm sure there's gonna be some fucking thing is gonna come up, or there's gonna be an injunction because it's the government, and we can fucking tax them, you know, fucking pay for that shit, but that's a whole other story altogether, as Del Preston would say. So, let's go ahead and get into this week's episode of The Metal Forge with Ozzy Darden from Children of the Reptile, and this is Burden.
right, Maniacs, I am being joined on the line right now from Ozzy. Not that Ozzy, goddammit. What are you thinking? No, this is Ozzy <laughs> from Children of the Reptile. And dude, what the fuck is up, man? Not much, man. I'm happy to be on here uh, gabbing with you and uh, all the uh, all the Metal Maniacs out there. Hell yeah, dude. And see, everybody thought that I I was thinking, you know, that holy shit, it's going to be like Ozzy Ozzy, right? And then, no, man, it's it's the <laughs> next best thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm number two on the list. Um, my my Ozzy is I E instead of Y, so that's that's the, that's the easy way to tell us apart. Well, honestly, his Ozzy should be with a Y because why the fuck, man? Like, <laughs> holy shit! Some of the stuff that that dude has went through, fucking insane. So yeah, definitely his with a Y because you have to question him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, uh, he's he's the king. So you guys are from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Yes, sir. Uh, down down on the beach. Um, ah, man, that's awesome. Um, you know, which is which is totally cool because a fellow North Carolinian, I guess, would be the 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 correct way to say that. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, Car- yeah, that's, that's, that's Carolinite, right. uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, North Carolinian, that's that's the one. N- North Carolinian, uh, Mr. Jason Gardner from the Heavy Metal Wasteland and Temptations Wings was like, dude, you have to get these dudes on the show. And we finally made it happen after a few times of being like, oh, fuck, man, I forgot, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Which it's metal. Everybody fucking forgets metal, you know, yeah. in metal we, at we some aren't, point. We aren't doing this. We aren't aren't doing this because we're good at you know following schedules or showing up to work on time you know that kind of crap yeah we're not doing this because we're particularly good at life right (laughs) i'll say it i'll definitely say that shit no (laughs) i'll I'll agree with it that's that's for sure 100 percent. i am definitely no no good at the life uh, life thing that's why i sell (laughs) auto parts for uh, for (laughs) shit so uh how is wilmington man i've never actually i don't think i've actually ever been there well, it's it's hard to get. Well, it's not necessarily hard to get to Wilmington, but it is kind of out of the way. Like a lot of bands don't really come through here. They'll they'll hit Raleigh. Uh, maybe if you got to stop in Myrtle Beach, um, it's kind of on the way. But we're sort of just to the east of that, like ninety five corridor. Just um, you, you got to kind of go out of your way to to get here. But you know, it's a mid mid sized city. Um, we got the beach. Uh, we got the river. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Blue Velvet, David Lynch film. Yeah, uh, that was that was filmed here. I feel like that movie like captures the vibe of this town very uh, excellently because um, during the daytime it's very like nice, pretty you know southern beach town, uh, lots of tourists. But at night they're just like an old port city, so there's like these really dark vibes around here too, uh, especially after dark. Nice. That I mean, hey, nothing wrong with that at all. Um, oh yeah. But I do know we got we got character is what I what I like to tell people. We're like we're like dark Charleston. <laughs> nice. Fuck yeah, though. That's that's pretty damn cool, though. I mean, yeah. You know, have, having a city that has character it is. I think it's a big thing. You know, because like Savannah has character for like the oh, all yeah. the swamp metal that comes out of there. So yeah, we're we're kind of in that swampy uh we got the great dismal swamp a few miles north of us um on the we're on the cape fear river you know it's uh it's just oozing with with fucking darkness down here man interesting <laughs> see you know the last time i was in north carolina i went to um chesapeake bay virginia okay and so i just basically i got on uh basically where what street the boardwalk is down there and i just drove south and i drove south for about an hour and ended up i was just screwing around in in north carolina there you know just uh, yeah and yeah it is that part of north carolina is definitely the the whole swampy thing as well because it's right on the coastline and shit it's kind of creepy to drive through there and you get like the freshwater swamp that's that connects to the ocean and you're just on a uh you know a a single like two-lane road (laughs) yeah and it's very very sparsely populated up there too oh yeah northeast corner north carolina so yes really uh 
really a crazy crazy vibe up that way yeah it really is it, it's it is crazy and there's a lot of uh like uh there is a lot of farmland and stuff up there too with like mm-hmm. you know and just seeing all the overgrowth and shit and and it's just you know next thing you see is like the ocean and you're like fuck man this is creepy <laughs> fucking drive off the road or something and you're never seen again <laughs> yeah yeah I've, I've had some scary nighttime drives um through eastern north carolina and yeah like if you start falling asleep like it's not not too many inches between you and uh you and the grave (laughs) oh hell no uh but before we get into actually uh talking some more about the band and everything i do want to give a shout out to another uh north carolinian who actually lives in wilmington also lauren uh super cool she's been listening to the show for a while now and she is actually setting up Metal Night at the Eagles Dare in downtown oh. Wilmington. And the, I believe uh, by the time this will uh, will air, she'll have already had a show or two under her belt. But, yeah, so that's a pretty cool thing, too. So that's got something to look forward to also. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've know the know the lauren you're talking about too Um, awesome (laughs) hell yeah man yeah Uh, so tell everybody out in metal forge land about children of the reptile yeah uh, children of the reptile we started in 2009 uh so we've been around for 13 14 years now um sort of doing the the new wave of traditionally traditional heavy metal thing uh before it was called that um around here especially back then like stoner metal was was very much the uh the thing that was happening um not not just here but everywhere you know kylesa all that sort of stuff uh, baroness uh, but weed eater and asg are, are from here they're definitely big big bands in that genre uh, and we love those guys we played with them a ton back then but people back then kind of didn't know what to do with us because we were playing you know iron maiden metallica judas priest type stuff um uh, manila road big influence for us and uh the, the times have sort of caught up to us now. Um, and there's been some other great uh, new wave of traditional heavy metal type bands from North Carolina, from the area here. Mega Colossus for one, Twisted Tower Dyer, who actually started in Virginia, but are based in Raleigh now. Um, so, yeah, we just, uh, me and my buddy Chris, we started the band because we loved uh, Metallica riffs and Iron Maiden, Thin Lizzy, Judas Priest guitar harmonies and decided let's make a band based around that and uh, i'd like to think we've uh, done a pretty good job since definitely it says here on the metal archives which i like to consult a lot but i've found a lot of uh it's like wikipedia fact or fiction and i've i say that in a lot of episodes (laughs) because (laughs) uh because for everything that is right there is also is equally portioned of wrong things that are on there wrong information (laughs) it says that uh, you and chris um were actually from two two remnants of other bands which is death machine weapons and wrath lord and then from yeah. there is what you all had actually had done to create children of the reptile yep pretty pretty much um death machine weapons was a band i played in god like probably 2006 2007 for a while um we were we were good uh actually the drummer uh, his name's ralph alexander he's like he went to the musicians industry institute out in la and now he's like a drum tech like he'll, he'll he plays live with the stroke sometimes and shit. Like he's kind of a, he's like a big session musician out there in LA now, but Holy we were kind of doing like a pan. Yeah. We were kind of doing like a Pantera lamb of God thing. Um, Chris was in wrath Lord and they were doing straight up like Megadeth, uh, iron maiden. Um, so once, once death machine weapons broke up, like him and wrath Lord kind of drifted apart. We actually started off doing a, uh, they were doing like a, a cover covers night for Halloween and uh, I was hanging out with Chris one night, and we were drinking some beers. And I was like, "Let's fucking do a Judas Priest <laughs> cover cover band for for that for the cover night." And he was like, "All right, hell yeah!" Right um, and we started jam. Yeah, we started jamming with uh, two other guys, uh, Pills and John. Pills is still in the band. John left uh, several years ago. Right. Um, great guy. No no bad blood or anything. But uh, we started doing that, and um, we kind of decided to to keep it going there. Um, there was actually an, an abortive attempt to, to form children of the reptile earlier with a totally different drummer and bass player. Uh, we played like one show. It, it didn't work out. 
um, they were nice guys, but like they just kind of weren't weren't necessarily up, up to snuff <laughs> uh, as players. Um, but anyway, when me and John, Chris, and Pill started jamming together, uh, they were just like, "Let's do Children of the Reptile again," and uh, there there we went. <laughs> Hell yeah, man! That's awesome. See, j- just to eat, everybody has their their people that they've got to find. You know, look at those early yeah. look at the early Megadeth albums. You know, they've mm-hmm. got, you know, it's Dave and Dave, and then it's, you know, like Chris Poland or Gar Samuelson and, and Jeff Young, yeah. and uh, then, you know, like Nick Menza and Marty Free, you know, so they were ever yeah. an ever constant evolving uh, band up until up until that certain point, like, you know, like what, like rust in peace or some shit. And yeah, for sure. So, yeah. Everybody has their deal to where they have to find the people that work for them. The the people mm-hmm. that, you know, that you're right on par with that the ones that make you be a better performer and a better player. Yeah. And I think just this year now, uh, chase, our current drummer is, uh, longer tenured with us than John was. <laughs> so, uh, Under- we, yeah. we have, yeah, we have had some changes early, but once once we got the guys, like it's it's been uh it's it's been real real good, uh real real steady. Um I don't want to do this band without any of these guys. Like if any one of them left, we think very hard about just, you know, calling it quits or calling it something else entirely like it's Yeah. It's, it's not just it's not just me even though I'm the guy you're talking to like it's it's all four of us we are a, a co- cohesive unit. Definitely. That's absolutely true, you know, and and that's cool that that works for you. That's your dynamic of being in a band. Yeah. With it, with these other three guys because you know, I once read a liner note from Another Perfect Day from Motorhead. And yeah. what was said in there completely blew me away because when Fast Eddie Clark left the band back on the uh, right after Iron Fist, right, Lemmy had talked about you know should he start over and, and you know because the class what they what everybody refers to as the classic lineup was gone at that point so should they start over and then he thought you know he was 38 years old and he was like you know no i'm too old to start over so that's where they <laughs> that's where they got brian robertson in and i think that's a very interesting interesting thing as well and i think i did that exact same thing we had a, yeah. we had a guitar player leave in my band and i was like fuck this I was like 28 at the time. I was like, I'm not starting over. We're continuing yeah. on. Fuck this guy. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm turning 39 in uh, five days. So, uh, well, actually, less than five days. I've already lost my ability to count. Um, this, this Friday, I'll be <laughs> turning 39. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I know that, know that feeling. Like, I, I wouldn't be able to start, start it up again. Right. Oh, absolutely. Because it's almost like, you know, when you put in the effort to a band, you know, that's 13, 15, 30, 50 years, you know, I (laughs) couldn't imagine somebody like Rob Halford, who's been in a band 25 years and just says, all right, guys, I think I'm done. I'm going to go do this other thing. And then, holy shit, you know, like it's fight. Don't get me wrong. But and fights. great. But like fight was great. And or, you know. Bruce Dickinson doing the same thing. I just couldn't imagine, you know, fucking yeah. being that guy and just saying, "All right, <laughs> I'm done." But then, yeah. but they both came back around the same time, so that's all good. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I read Rob Halford's autobiography recently, and uh, if, if you haven't read it, I would recommend it. To oh, you or I love, so, yeah. I love so, Confess. It is such a great so, book. So good. Yeah. Uh, I am actually I, I read picked, her in like about a day. Oh yeah, same. Uh, I actually picked up Biblical over the weekend, and I'm okay. I'm anxious to delve into that. And I like the audio books because he he narrates them. Oh yeah, so it's even better because it, it's like Rob telling you Rob's story, which is awesome. Yeah, that is great. I listened to an audio book. Um, actually, it was like on one of our little. Uh, tours we did um on the way back i listened to waylon jennings autobiography read by waylon jennings and that was fucking incredible i love waylon jennings uh i have not i have not listened to that or read yeah who doesn't Uh, (laughs) i have not read his autobiography nor have i listened to it but i want to so bad because it's like yeah it's cool because it's waylon fucking jennings you know 
Yeah, yeah, he's got lots of insane, uh, In, yeah. insane cocaine stories. <laughs> oh, for sure. So by uh, you know the metal archives here, it shows your all's first e- uh, release was an EP back in 2012, Manifesto of the Reptilian Agenda. And then a full length in 2013, Mm self-titled Children of the Reptile. So, and the three the three songs from the EP just were all also on the the full length, right? Not really, which is pretty common. (laughs) Which is pretty common in the independent setting and everything. So, why was it you know four four years removed? Um, why well, was what four years removed uh, the, uh, from oh, the, the, the formation first, oh, okay. to, yeah, I, to I the first okay, actual yeah, full length album? I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, it just kind of took us a while to get the get the money together. Um, we we kind of didn't want to go in into our own pockets too much. Um, and plus, I mentioned also I'm I'm turning 39. All these other guys in the band are like a few years younger than me. Chris is like seven years younger than me. Dills is eight. Chase is a baby. He, I think he just turned thirty. <laughs> um, so, and, and John was was those guys' age. So, like when we were getting started, like they, they were like high school kids. Like they didn't have jobs or anything. Oh, like, okay. Sit sitting around in their rooms, you know. Um, so yeah, like I I didn't I had a job, you know. I was I was working full time, but I was like I'm not gonna spend all this money to do this right now. <laughs> um, and plus, you know, a lot of it was just us, you know, getting together playing playing shows um i mean you'll you'll see on metal archives we tend to go a while in between releases and we're um hoping to do better about that in the future obviously covid threw a huge wrench into the into the works for that but oh for sure it also took us yeah it took us a while to like get the songs written for this this latest one we're doing too but yeah it's just we're we're kind of a slow moving band um we we do it very much part-time on the side of like the rest of our lives uh we, we take it very seriously but it's um it's not the main focus 100 percent of the time i i would say for any of us definitely no and, and that's what you know that's what i always am am interested in like why does it take bands so long or so little so so short amount of times to to put out albums you see bands that put out albums like once a year for like five or six yeah. years straight uh which yeah it's, over- it's crazy and I have I have nothing but respect for those guys. Like they they hustle and they work their asses off. Um, I wouldn't say we're lazy, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe our hustle is not as strong as some other guys out there. Well, I mean, I think it's again, you know, it's finding the the right group of people that get together and do the thing. You know, they you you all have your way of doing things. Like uh, I'm sure Jason's band, uh, Temptations Wings, has their way of doing things. My band, Overload, has their way of doing things, and Metallica has their way. Yeah, for sure. You know, which is pretty cool because as it is, you all have released two full length albums by mm-hmm. um, uh, in 2013, 2018, and Heavy is the Head is supposed to be releasing this year. Yeah, April seventh when that's going to be coming out. Um, we're really proud of it. Um, yeah, it, it's taken us a while since our last album, but um, th- this anyone anyone that loves heavy metal and listens to this album is going to fucking love it. Like it's 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 good shit. Hell yeah! Super proud of it. And and just so everybody knows, by the time uh, this a- this interview actually airs, it will be a week away. From, so in in the next week, you're gonna oh, have this whole new go. this whole new album, nine songs. And yeah, like, y'all uh, y'all better listen to it out there. I'm gonna come and fucking get you. Hell yeah! And and as always, you know, <laughs> links links are always listed below. So uh, and and we'll get into that later. I I'll do the spiel that I do in, in every episode or anything. So again, nine songs. It looks like here um, based on from what I can see of it, it was done at TMF Studios in Raleigh um, and mastered at Basement Studios. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. Uh, so what all went into the the production of the album? I mean, how does a typical studio session look for you guys? So this was a... Um, it, it was a, a good time doing this, but it was... Um, TMF Studios is not like an established studio. It's our, our friend Stephen Klein, who formerly played guitar in Mega Colossus. Um, 
he's trying to get a studio off the ground. Um, he loves us. We love him. So he was like, Hey, just, I want to record your album for you. Come do it with me. And, uh, you know, we live in Wilmington. He lives in Raleigh. Raleigh's, uh, Raleigh's a two hour drive from us. Um, so what we would do is we would go up for a weekend and just stay at his house and just record everything. Uh, the first weekend we got drums and bass down. Um, after that, it was all guitars and vocals, which took forever. You, you know how guitarists oh, yeah. and vocalists, how guitarists and vocalists are. And I myself do guitar and vocals for the band. So, oh my gosh. Um, I'm yeah. a, ba- I'm a bassist so it was, and vocalist, yeah. so I get it. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, we were, um, it, it took several weekends to get everything recorded and get all the solos done. Um, so it was a long process because there were, you know, we couldn't just be like, okay, we're blocking off weekends for a whole month to do this or a whole two months to do this. We would just kind of get up there when, when we all could when, when as, as time allowed. So it was a lengthy recording process. Um, but I would say when we get in the studio, we're very efficient we get stuff done. We don't really stop and dick around and like get high and drunk and shit. <laughs> um, we, we get there and, and do everything and generally do a pretty good job. Well, yeah, because you can't sit there and get trashed because it's actual work, you know, and, and this is money, yeah. you know, in the feasible sense of doing things like this, let's just, for example, just say this is money that you guys, you know, are, feasibly spending so yeah you don't want to waste anybody's time or do anything like that just being trashed in the studio and not getting good takes you know yeah exactly that was that's always one of the things that interests me as a musician personally is how long did it take or what you know what did you do how did you break it up did you go for a week did you stay there for a month you know it's all that shit yeah it was yeah in terms of overall time it was slow but when we were actually in there like we worked very quickly is is what i would say it was probably i can't even remember it was maybe over the course of just 2021 and a little bit in 2022 uh, for recording and then mixing and stuff um and steven our producer who's excellent if you're in the raleigh north carolina area and you are looking for somebody to produce an album for you he's so good um, he makes great suggestions. He challenges you, not in a dickheaded way, um, but in a way that kind of really brings out your best. Um, sorry for that little aside there. No, no, that's absolutely <laughs> true because, you know, because in the independent scene, you know, we're not working with people like Mutt Lang and Rick Rubin and yeah. Butch Vig and those guys from the day. You know, we're working with the people who are – you know, who's either a home studios we're going to, or we're producing this ourselves kind of thing. So I think that really matters when, you know, you have a, a studio out there that's willing to take you on as a, as an artist and say, you know what, guys, I'm not just hitting the record button and mixing and mastering this for you. I am actually lending you a service that, you know, is is something that everybody needs. I think everybody needs a a production uh not necessarily I wouldn't say like a producer per se, but somebody outside of the band to say are you sure you want to do it this way because here's what I'm hearing. Yeah. And some and some bands that I've been in, uh some people get really upset over that. <laughs> they do. Um they they definitely do. Um most of the time it's uh, yeah. drummers guitar players and singers <laughs> uh the bass yeah. players usually just like yeah man i'll try something whatever you know or, um but yeah it, it, when you I'll, go fiddling with the drummer's beat and then he gets pissed i'll give you a good bass player so our bass player uh david huffam we call him pills it's not like pills drugs it's pills. he's a chubby guy so he just was known as pillsbury as a kid i guess Aww. um so and yes yeah, he doesn't take offense to it at all that he's he, pills that's just his name but He's kind of a he's a space cadet in a very funny way. Um, we were getting ready to record the bass tracks, and he was just asleep on this couch. And when he's asleep, like you cannot get him woken up. So we were just like, "Hey, pills! Like we're, we got to do the bass. We got to do the bass. Come on, wake up, wake up!" And he's just like sat there, like laid there for another thirty minutes while we just sat there. We're like, "Okay, well, like he's just not going to move." And like we we know this, 
this sounds like I'm talking shit about him, but I'm really not. <laughs> a, a, we were laughing about it at the time. Um, but then like eventually he just kind of like sat up, looked around, like walked over, picked up the bass and just literally, I'm not fucking kidding you, like one take everything just all the way through. Uh, then went and laid back down on the couch, went back to sleep. <laughs> And if you listen to this album, like there's, if you listen to what the bass is doing, and if you're a bass player, like listen to it, like he's doing some crazy shit. Like he's a really fucking good bass player. That's awesome. See, we need more bass player stories like that on the Metal yeah. Forge. Most <laughs> of the time, it's such a very bass player thing too. Like you, yeah. you wouldn't see like a guitar player do that. Like that's just a bass player kind of thing to do. <laughs> no, yeah, you're no, absolutely no right. offense. <laughs> yeah, like I, I try to be that way, and there will be some things that give me shit. You know, uh, like mm-hmm. w- some of the stuff my drummer can write can be just like overwhelming to me as a player and i'm like holy fuck but like any other time i'm just like all right let's do it and and try to lay it down uh first time (laughs) first time on time yeah (laughs) yeah and uh pills and chase our drummer like work really well together as a rhythm section um chris chris millard our, our other guitarist is a phenomenal guitar player like i really i truly believe he's one of the best guitarists in the world um he's he's so so fucking good um but Pills and Chase work together so well because um, Pills is like a very busy bass player and Chase is very different from most metal drummers. He kind of plays like just a very almost laid back, like just rock and roll style while we're playing, you know, like Metallica, Megadeth type riffs. I feel like it gives it like a different vibe. Um, and like one of the songs on the album, Warriors of Light, uh, they're pretty much doing just like a disco rhythm section behind heavy metal guitars. Like Chase is going four on the floor, like... <laughs> and pills and pills is doing these like 70s like like i'm sure that's such a great uh representation of it but if you listen to that like during the verses like it's it's almost like they're doing like disco shit on, underneath heavy metal it's, it's very cool hell yeah and see that's what it's all about you know it's about everybody it's not just about crazy guitar riffs or crazy high vocals or you know yeah anything. it's about all of it it all makes a difference and it's all building towards something yeah and like i love there's a lot of these bands that are basically like solo projects out there and like i love that i think that's really cool but what i love about our band that i feel like it would be hard to get in the solo project is it's really like we're we're all good players um every last one of us you know not trying to sound conceited or whatever, but we're all, we're all pretty good at what we do, but I still feel like we are greater than the sum of our parts because of how we all fit together as well. Absolutely. And see, that's, that's, a, that's a great thing to have. Uh, I, yeah, I'll, I'll clap for that. Hell yeah. Because <laughs> no, because it, I think it takes a lot to see that, you know, in a way you, you have completely have just taken away the personal aspect of it and made it about the collective yeah and And that's that's awesome that's the that's the fun of being a band i think is like you're you're hanging out with your buddies like it's you know it's it's a it's you know fucking uh bon scott said it best it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll um (laughs) that song explains it it's it's tough and mean um it's not all fun but if you're doing it with your buddies people you genuinely genuinely respect and love and enjoy enjoy hanging out with um that's really what it's all about it's not about the money it's not about you know how many fans you have or whatever it's just having a good time with your friends that's damn right i yes and on that note fuck yeah next week go buy this fucking album because (laughs) fuck yes okay so i'm gonna go ahead and switch over to some general profile questions with you mr ozzy and we're going to see what you, you know, how how music has affected your life. Yeah. Uh, what okay. is what was the first album you purchased? <laughs> this is a funny one. The very first album I purchased was a cassette tape, uh, Crisscross. <laughs> nice. The, uh, the two the two rapper kids. Um, yeah, all the, their pants up, and shit on backwards. Yeah, yeah. I missed the bus. You know, those guys, that was the first album I ever, ever bought um, at the store. Although, really, I think I was like eight, so my dad probably, or mom probably bought it for me. Um, 
the first one I think I bought with my own money was uh, Pearl Jam Vitology. I think that was it. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Which, yeah, I, you know, I, I was born in 84. So like when I was really starting to listen to music was, you know, when I was like nine, 10, 11, that's mid nineties. Height of height of the grunge era. So I just was on the radio. Like I was like, oh, I'll get this Pearl Jam album because I like this one song. And I don't really think I, I still will put on 10 every now and then. Um, I think that's got some fucking bangers on it, <laughs> but Vitology, like God, I probably haven't listened to that since I was 13 or 14, <laughs> you know? And, and that's the interesting thing is like, I don't know what was in the water in 1991 in music, but something definitely was because look at look at the shit that was released in 91 you know you had 10 you had smells like teen spirit uh mm -hmm. uh or i'm sorry never mind never you, mind yeah, yeah you had never mind uh you had the black album you had both the use your illusion albums you know just crazy fucking big album yeah. shit you know oh yeah so something was definitely definitely in the water in 91 yeah and man, like this is a little quick aside. But like, people like like to like. This sounds like I'm got an axe to grind, and I really don't. It's just kind of a funny observation. But people really like kind of hate on that Black album now. I think they're crazy. That album is fucking cool. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I mean, I bought the the big ass box set. Yeah. When it came out uh, for the 30th anniversary, so yeah, I am totally down with that because <laughs> it's just because that's the the era that I remember most from Metallica where, yeah, I did hear justice yeah. first and it blew me away. And then that, because I had old older siblings, hell yeah. So yeah, I totally get that. I have another, uh, another Metallica opinion for you. Um, and justice for all, like people will also like bitch about the production on that album. And I get it. Yeah. Like you can't hear the bass at all. Um, but for those songs, like, they're all like so like malevolent and angry. Like they're still clearly just so fucking pissed off about Cliff. Um, they were, they're like processing it through the album basically. And it's just such an angry malevolent album. Like I feel like it makes it sound like almost inhuman and frightening, like the no bass, the very like compressed process sound of it. And like, I've come to just really enjoy the sound of that album. Like, I don't think there's anything else like it. And no, like the riffs, no, the riffs on it are just insane. Um, in the first place, uh, we, we draw a lot of influence from that record in particular. But I understand that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the production of it is is good. It fits, it fits what it's what it's supposed to be. I think. No, definitely. You know, that's a, one of my uh, things as well. Like, I always wonder: Did they have any of these riffs prior to Cliff's passing? And are the and because I don't have that box set, so I don't know if there's any demos that possibly Cliff had played on. Yeah. Uh, but for example, there is rumor out there where uh, ACDC completely scrapped the Back in Black album. What was there with uh, that Bon Scott had been working on, and completely wrote a new album with Brian, yeah, with yeah. Brian Johnson. But then again, yeah, I was like reading about that the other day, actually. But then again, I've also heard, you know, rumor that it was the other way around that like uh, Brian came in and put his own vocals over the tracks that they didn't use anything of Bonds that was on that they had had. So I, I, those are things that I that interest the shit out of me as a musician personally. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, what would make you more nervous? Playing a show to five people or 5,000 people? Honestly, I think five people would make me more nervous. And I've definitely done that several times um, in my career. I've never played to 5,000 people, so I, I can't say for sure. Well, but we're going to change that. Can, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, here's hoping. Um, but five people can be like, it can be such a weird vibe sometimes. Um, like sometimes the people are just like standing there and like, um, like it, it's tough when it's a small crowd. Cause people like don't want to break the cool code and be the guy who starts headbanging. So everybody's just kind of standing there. So there's, it's tough to, it's tough to work a crowd if the crowd doesn't want to be worked, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, but if there's 5,000 people, like 
they're all there because they really want to be. <laughs> yes, so, for like, sure. You, you, you're, you're starting out with the advantage of a crowd of five people. Like they probably don't know who you are. So you're, you're working from a disadvantage there. I feel like so. Yeah, I would say five people. I'd I'd feel more nervous about. Yeah, I've always been pretty good, pretty good in front of crowds or whatever. They 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 bring out the best in me. So well, that's awesome. I, I, I would not be nervous about it. I don't think. Yeah, that see, that's where it's about too. Is even if it is five people, you know, if they bring out the best in you, then you know you're going to give them their money's worth and, and all yeah. of that too. The, and we've, we've got a great show playing for just one guy one time and he was like very supportive for whatever i was like i was just like having a conversation with him on stage and stuff uh, it was pretty ultimately a fun experience we, we've had a few shows where we played like one or two people but our attitude is like well let's just treat this like a free practice instead of acting like we're pissed off assholes about it in fact um that brings me to another point i saw raven recently uh, when they did their um they were wiped out tour yeah um and they came to Reggie's, our, our venue in, in Wilmington, um, which we've got a pretty good crowd in Wilmington. But the problem was they were playing on the same night Iron Maiden was playing in Greensboro. Oh, shit. And the Raven, the Raven show was kind of a late add to their tour or whatever. So everybody already had their tickets for it. Um, I had not gotten the tickets for Iron Maiden because I, I think I was um, – me and my wife actually went to Germany for our 10-year wedding anniversary earlier this year. And we were just – we were over there for when, when Maiden was playing. But – the week, the couple days after we got back, Raven was playing at Reggie's. There were like seven people there. Um, Mark was up there, and he said like one of the coolest things anybody's ever said. It's like it's like, well, the lights are on us. Uh, it's it's dark out here, but it's bright up here. Like we can't tell if there's seven people or seven thousand out there. <laughs> they they just they played played their fucking hearts out. Like it's one of my favorite experiences ever. Um, just those guys just not acting like big time rock stars or whatever, like pissed off that like there wasn't, wasn't anybody at the show really. Um, but those of us that were there, like we were, we were rocking out and like, I appreciated them going 110%. Um, even though, you know, there wasn't a big crowd for them. Oh, for sure. And you know, uh, John was just recently on the metal forge back in January and yeah, was, I listened, I listened to that episode. Oh, for sure. Such a great guy. Like, yeah, I felt like, you know, like a real kinship with him. Like, I, like I immediately felt like, you know, uh, because, you know, singing bass player, like a kind of like a brothers in arms yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah, super rad guy to talk to. I definitely want to have them back on the, on the show here uh, again. Yeah. And I, I, I love, I love listening to that episode too. Cause like they're, they're, they're a pretty big deal to us, but like they still just treat it like they're just, you know, just working class guys, you know, just out there in the trenches like the rest of us. Oh, yeah. It's pretty awesome. No, absolutely. So, speaking of, if a touring band were to come into, you know, your city, where would you tell them to go eat? I would tell them to go to uh, Flaming Amy's Burrito Barn. (laughs) (laughs) I love the Um, name. (laughs) Yeah. Well, our big venue in town, like, we've kind of lost some venues over the last 10 years, uh, but the one we have left that's like a a true just rock venue is is called Reggie's 42nd Street Tavern. Uh, It's called 42nd because it's on 42nd Street. So there you go. But right around the corner from that is uh, Flaming Amy's Burrito Barn. It's it's been around for 20 some years. They do burritos. Um, What's interesting about their approach to burritos is they basically like they don't really do Mexican. It's not traditional Mexican food at all. Um, They basically just like they've got, for instance, they've got one called the bacon double cheeseburger burrito. It's just a bacon cheeseburger in a burrito and then they've got a a po' boy it's just a shrimp po' boy in a burrito uh dude all kinds of stuff like that yeah it's it's just it's like different different cuisines just in burritos you can get pictures of cheap beer there um my wife uh when i when we first started dating she worked there um and it's like a very rock and roll place like the, the owners are like rockers from way back so like all the girls that work there, like the cool rock and roll girls, and like I managed to snag one of them. Uh, but I would go there, and uh, she would always give me like give me free food and shit. So I'd basically be there three times a week, just like getting fed. It was pretty awesome, dude. That's rad as fuck. And you're speaking to yeah. you're speaking to the inner fat kid uh, to me <laughs> and everything. And you oh, know, yeah. you know that's 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 always so rad. And it, that to me is one of those stories, like. Um, the adult film actress Chloe used to when I remember watching a behind the music on Poison and they would always invite 
the the chicks over and they'd be like hey can you bring a pizza on your way because they had they didn't have money to eat <laughs> or anything and just because of who yeah. they were you know they were like oh yeah well, well sure we'll ho- we'll hook you up <laughs> and it, so yeah that's that's funny shit and it sounds like my kind of place so now i'm gonna have to come to uh wilmington and everything and, and just yeah uh, it's just to do it you know <laughs> it's it's definitely the spot it's uh their their tagline is hot fast cheap and easy so <laughs> hey that sounds like that should be an album title yeah yeah i think you're right about that i have to talk to old jay he's a owner about it <laughs> hell yes so is there a piece of gear or an instrument out there that you have always wanted to have but you've never been able to get it man i really i um, mean Chris, our other guitar player has like a couple, I think actually, but I really want like a, an eighties Japanese, uh, like Ibanez, um, especially like even one like the, the gym, like the Steve Vai ones. Oh yeah. Um, I, I play a, a Les Paul, um, and I also have a, a Strat, but I don't really have, um, what I would call a shred stick. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, like a, you know, just one of those eighties super strats, with like the Floyd Rose and, um, all, all that crazy stuff, you know, the 24 frets, all that, all that crazy shit. Um, I've never had one of those guitars and it's not like they're like that unattainable, but like, it's also like, I don't like need another guitar. Like I'm, I'm still just going to like play my Les Paul all the time anyway. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> right. I'll, I'll play the, I'll play the strap for some stuff. If I need to do like some whammy bar shit. Um, Chris has like, he literally has like 25 guitars. I have five or five or six. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I've had, <laughs> he's, I've he's had a, a lot a guitar of guitars guy. in my day. <laughs> I've had a lot of guitars in my day, and all yeah. a lot of them at one time. And you know, Gibson TV, and I've been. This has been kind of my point of interest here lately, is watching like a lot of these Icon series interviews with Gibson TV, and now they're doing the the quote the collection interview, yeah. uh, like <laughs> where they're going into like. Um, they go into like uh, Rick Springfield's house and they show his guitar uh, as I've called it a guitar archive <laughs> um, because dude owns like 160 Les Pauls Ooh. just Les Pauls then yeah. and it's like oh well here's these cra- here's this crazy fucking line of of doves that he has and here's this crazy line of fenders that he has and and they go through and the cool thing about like with Gibson is yeah it's there to you know because they have these crazy big Gibson collections but there's they they show the competition on there they show the BC yeah. riches and they show the the fenders and the Jacksons and the Charvels just as much as as the Gibsons, and I think that's rad as shit. And yeah, so Hell yeah, so yeah, having twenty five guitars is it, for <laughs> for being an independent musician. That's a lot, you know. Yeah, he's gotten really good deals on a lot of them, um, and plus he's he'll get guitars, and then like some of them will like go crazy on the market, and then he'll sell one, so he'll have money for another guitar. Then <laughs> right, so, Reverb um, is great. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I bought a um a you're a bass player. I bought a, a PVT forty oh. a couple years ago, and like when I got, it, I just got it off a, a guy on Craigslist for like two hundred bucks. But like now they've gone insane. Like, yeah, they're like twelve hundred like, bucks now. Yeah, and like I love that bass because like it's it's a piece of music history. Like I think the the T forty and the T sixties were like kind of the first like CNC machined guitars that were made. Period. Right. So it's like kind of a neat piece of music history. Also, I think the T40 is just like the coolest fucking bass ever. Just the, I love the, the wiring design, setup. It's, yeah, yeah, it's so unique and interesting. Um, and I, I want to start start up like a side band where I play bass, so I can get up there and play it. Definitely, fucking a hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> well, there's there's three bases from that era that like speak to me because they all have a similar body design and everything. Um, one is the T40 slash T60 series. Um, yeah. the, the other is the Ampeg base, which is like the acrylic, uh, base back in the oh, day. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the other is the, uh, the Gibson Grabber or Ripper base. Uh, those three bases all have like a similar, like, look to me. 
and yeah. and they're all heavy fucking like crazy pieces of shit bases so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you could you could easily uh commit uh homicide with them and mostly oh, yeah yeah <laughs> for sure so <laughs> Uh, I do have one more question for you, but before we get into it, as always, links are listed below, so please give a like, share, and a follow. Go buy albums, go buy merch, go see these dudes live, because that's where it's fucking at, is supporting the bands in every, in anything that they do, you know, whether it's, you know, buying an album, buying a digital download, buying a shirt, what the fuck ever, just support in some way possible. Oh, yeah. Do you and know? yeah, if you're uh, if you're listening to this now, um, there's there's if you're interested in what you're hearing so far, there's already a couple of singles out for the album, and um, I think yeah, if you're saying this will be airing a week before the album comes out, we'll have just put out the third and final single single for it. So if you're hearing this, uh, there's three singles out for it already. Um, so go check those out if you like them. Hell yeah! Uh, you can pre-order the album on Bandcamp and uh, enjoy it. Definitely. Do you have any shout outs you want to give to anybody today? Um, shout out my wife, Molly. Um, she's probably in the other room right now listening to me laughing. Um, <laughs> give, <laughs> uh, definitely want to give a shout out to, um, Stephen Klein, our producer. Um, he really did a great job for us. And, um, let's see. Uh, shout out to John Kiker, our old drummer. <laughs> Good guy. Right on. Yeah, man. that should be. Hell that should yeah. be about it, I guess. Hell yeah! Dude. I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, and they're, they're going to yell at me later. But oh no! For now it happens. <laughs> and, and I'm going to give a shout out to Jason from uh, Temptations Wings and Heavy Metal yes, Wasteland yeah. here, right on the Metal Forge, uh, for hooking us up and getting and getting you on the on yeah. the show because yeah, dude, I this think has he's going to have us. Yeah, I think yeah. he's going to have us play his uh, his festival in Asheville too. The, uh, yeah, his, uh, and Steel you actually, and Stone. Yes, Steel and Stone. I believe that's going to be the first Friday in November. Uh, details yeah. about that will be coming up because uh, there's uh, a few people that are playing that show. And I'm going to go ahead and break yeah. it. With Twisted, Twisted Twi- Tower Dyer, baby. Yeah, you <laughs> broke it up right there. Twisted Tower Dyer. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I didn't, I didn't want to blow up your spot. Sorry. No, absolutely. <laughs> you are totally cool with that. And possibly the, uh, there's this band from Louisville uh, coming down. Probably Overload will be there as well, which is my band. Um, oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> so fuck yeah. Yeah, man. that'll be awesome. Awesome stuff all around. So thank you, Jason, for hooking us up and, you know, doing your festival and all of that shit as well. So final question of the day is what kind of music did your parents listen to? And, okay. And did it have an impact on the music that you make? Okay. Yeah. That's a pretty good question. Um, my dad, was a southern rock guy uh jimmy jimmy buffett guy um but mostly on the radio uh boston guy aerosmith guy um the first two tapes i ever had he gave me aerosmith toys in the attic on cassette and just the boston self-titled on cassette um i wouldn't say i'm a huge aerosmith fan but toys in the attic like that album fucks it's got some heaters on it it's good shit um boston self-titled obviously is like just incredible like one of the one of the best like 70s rock albums out there um yeah 100 percent. and i would say like we are a traditional heavy metal band but i would like to think that you can definitely hear southern rock in our music for sure um we try not to hide it we we're we're southern boys you know we we, we want to get that get that music <laughs> music out there like we like just that get down boogie rock and roll type music um so yeah the the kind of stuff my dad had me listening to in the car growing up was uh definitely a huge huge influence on me my mom not so much um she just kind of listened to whatever was on the radio on the 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 basic pop station um um you know it's fine but she just wasn't as into music as my dad is understandable hell yeah and and 
You know, and I'm going to go ahead and answer that question for everybody as well, too, because, yes, I think that, honestly, the music that my dad listened to back in the day, uh, and he and he really dug a lot of stuff, but, like, he, his primary focus was, like, classic country, like we were talking Waylon Jennings earlier. He was yeah. a huge Waylon Jennings, Hank Williams, you know, yeah. fan. But then again, you know, yeah. he liked a lot of stuff. And yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's an interesting thing of, of yeah. even if you don't have a, you know, somebody who's, you know, feeding you the Black Sabbath or the Metallica or anything like that, and yeah. you discover them on your own. Yeah. My dad did not. He just didn't like Black Sabbath. He would like Iron Man would come on the radio, and I would be like, "Please, like this song sounds cool as fuck." And he was like, "Oh, I don't really like Black Sabbath. What? These guys are weird." <laughs> but it was all like Leonard Skinner, Molly Hatchet with him, um, which is also very good. But yeah, he, he just was not into the the metal. Like I, I came to that on my own, but my love of fucking rock and roll guitars definitely <laughs> came from him. So it's it, it's all it's all part of the same same stew, you know. Fuck yeah, man. See, that's that's where it's about right there. That's beautiful. Dude, Ozzy, thank you so much for coming on the Metal Forge this week. This has kicked ass. This has been a great conversation, and I look forward to actually seeing you guys at Jason's Fest coming up in November. Hopefully before then. Yeah, that's Hopefully. awesome. I, I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know y'all were going to be on it, so I'll be definitely looking forward to that too. Definitely. And hopefully we can, you know, maybe hook you guys up with a show up here in Louisville too, you know, just like everybody yeah, else. Yeah, I'd love to, love to come up that way. Fuck yeah, we've, man. Uh, we've, we've never played Kentucky, but uh, we're talking about country. I'm like a, I'm a big, at least old school country music fan. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, so, so many, so many great, great artists have come out of Kentucky in that vein. Uh, Loretta Lynn, Dwight Yoakam. Yeah. Um, even some of the newer guys, Tyler Childers, Chris Stapleton. Um, good shit. Y'all, y'all got good good music coming out of Kentucky. <laughs> Which is funny because uh, Tyler Childers uh, is part of a deal with a guy. Look up. I mean, this goes out to the to the metalheads out there as well. Look up the laid back country picker. You okay. Want, oh yeah. You uh, everybody out there who looks that up will not be disappointed. And listen to the song LB's Truth. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'll I'll look that up in a minute. Yeah. Definitely. Sounds like right up my alley. Hell yeah. Yeah. I, I listen. I listen to heavy metal half the time and like old country the other half the time. <laughs> I, I get it. Usually I, I, do usually I start. I start drinking the beers and I'm like, yeah, let's fucking put on some like accept or something. Yeah. And then like once I'm good and drunk, I'm like, oh, all right, let's Tear put on the George Jones, Tor- put on the George Jones and start crying. <laughs> yeah. I totally get that dude. So on our way out today from the new album, what are we going to play? So this single will either be releasing or will have just released when this airs. Uh, let's go with silent circle. Um, that is track four, I think, okay. on Heavy as a Head. Um, this song's a really important one to us. Um, three out of the four of us have um, lost parents um, in the past several years. Mm. And um, the, uh, the the woman you mentioned, Lauren, um, her her boyfriend, Carlos Dinojian, Dinojian, sorry, um, he was a metal drummer here, uh, played in a band called Salvation. Um, he also played in Weed Eater. He played drums for uh, Pounder on one of their albums. Um, m- many of your listeners will probably know him. You know, he was friends with Jarvis from uh, from Night Demon. R- really great guy, really great drummer. Definitely. He passed away um, uh, back in 20, 2019 um, as well. Y- young man, just um, what it wasn't drugs or anything. So many, it, uh, that was something that pissed me off. Like people were like, Oh yeah, he's a rock and roll drummer's dr- drugs. And like, no, he, like all I did was drink beers. Like he just had a, had a brain aneurysm uh, after a run one day and just, he was gone. But silent circle is sent out to sent out to him, his spirit. Um, it's just a song about, uh, you know, the, the people that come in and out of our lives. Um, sometimes they're gone, but, what's what's left is is just as important um like one of the lines i wrote for the song is like the power go sorry the body goes but the power will always remain so silent circle this one's for you carlos this one's for you mom this one's for uh terry chris's dad and steve uh chase's dad so yeah that's the uh that's the send off for you <laughs> hell yeah man so as you heard him this is silent circle
What's up, Metal Forge fans? This is Alan Bishop, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest and head distiller at Spirits of French Lick. Do you find yourself drawn to the unexplained, fascinated by the Fortean, or enchanted by the paranormal? If the things that go bump in the night resonate in your mind, then tune into my brand new podcast, If You Have Ghosts, You Have Everything. Featuring first-hand accounts, collected stories, interviews, history, and speculation related to all things not of this world. Available now on Anchor, Spotify, Google, Amazon, and more. Set back, relax, and remember, if you have ghosts, you have everything. Hey, let me tell you guys about Mercenary Press. They're an independent London label and distributor of all things metal. Mercenary Press delivers the goods from their own independent zine. Trust me, you're going to want to get in on that. To distributing various bands from all over the world, including Cramp from Spain and Sadistic Force from Texas. Visit mercenarypress.bigcartel.com to find out what all they have in stock and what you can order. And for Metal Forge listeners, enter code METALFORGE10 to receive a discount on your total purchase at mercenarypress.bigcartel.com. Check it out now. Hey, Metalheads, it's with great pleasure I get to tell you guys about a new sponsor to the Metal Forge, Ageless Art, New Albany. After 20 years of owning and operating Ageless Art in Clarksville, Indiana, Phil Garrett had a vision for a new type of tattoo studio. Something that is clean and modern, sleek, refined, inviting. And he's done just that with Ageless Art in New Albany. You can find it at 2736 Charlestown Road, New Albany, Indiana, 47150. Business hours are Monday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sundays are 12 to 6. All sessions are appointment only, so give them a call and go get you some new ink. Or if it's your first time, go get your first one, baby. Since 2013, there has been a calling from the underground. From the graves of all those unholy. And they decided to make a zine to talk about all of this. Soul Grinder Zine! An independent metal zine to keep you informed on all things metal and horror from the underground. Available in both print and digital formats. They're bringing you the best interviews and reviews out there today. Not only do they do the zine, but they also do compilation CDs. Check them out at facebook.com slash soulgrinder.zine and start your subscription now. Hey everybody, let me tell you about the new sponsor to the Metal Forge, Unchained Tapes. They're an independent Pennsylvania tape label. They focus on extreme metal and punk with a killer approach to the tape scene. Visit their web store at unchainedtapes.bigcartel.com now to get your fill of tapes. And for being a Metal Forge listener, enter the code METALFORGE10 at checkout to get a 10% discount on your total purchase. That's unchainedtapes.bigcartel.com. Big Cartel.com. 